Now, here's my main bad guy, right, uh, in my account, all right, and uh, this is the one I take a lot of heat from, right, because there are any number of scholars, and there's an argument that you can make here that says that Immanuel Kant is an Enlightenment thinker. And I think there is some truth to that. If you say, here's 20 things that make you an Enlightenment thinker, I think Kant checks off about six of the boxes. Right? And that's a legitimate thing to say. But in my judgment, Kant is the first of the counter-Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, and he was doing his main writing in the 1780s. Uh, Critique of Pure Reason is his most famous work and the most important work in my view. Published uh, first edition in 1781. Uh, and I will just give you a quick thumbnail of why I see him as the beginning of the turn, from an Enlightenment to a counter-Enlightenment. And why Kant is also going to be important, and this is not a controversial claim in the history of philosophy, though, is that Kant basically conquered the German intellectual world by the time we get to 1800. And much of the story of German philosophy since then is the story of neo-Kantianism and reactions to Kant. Kant, as much as I will disagree with him, I have to say he is the most important philosopher of the last 200 and maybe 20 years or so. Now, just to telegraph right a few things there in the preface, uh, one of the things, uh, the book is called The Critique of Pure Reason. Right? So it's a critique of reason, right? And a critique of pure right reason. So there's some technical terminology built into there. But Kant, in his preface, says that his agenda is to say that Enlightenment philosophers are making all of these very grand, if not grandiose, claims for the power of reason. And my job is to put limits to it to say there's only certain things that you can reason your way up to. Beyond that, there are limits, and those limits are quite severe right, in the Kantian corpus. All right, so what we have then is a philosopher who is shifting away from how can reason solve all of our problems to saying, no, here are some limits to reason. And part of his motivation is to say that he, like many of the religious thinkers right, of the era, are very worried about this trend line. Right? Science is coming along, and it's increasingly naturalistic, and the scientists are coming up with all these explanations for things that really are in conflict with a lot of traditional religion. And so do I go with my scientific mind, or do I go with my religious heart? And that's a big, huge, right, gut-wrenching dilemma right, for so many people right, at the time. And it seems like the choice is, if you follow the trend line, right, science is increasing, religion is declining, that if we go along, then religion is just going to be out of human affairs. So we need to put limits to what reason can do, as Kant puts it, to make room for faith. Right? If we say reason is limited here, then beyond that, faith will have a safety zone, and we will continue to be able to articulate faith. And if you emphasize that point, that is not an enlightenment point, right? but it is central to Kant's argument. Kant uh, uh, labels himself a Copernican revolutionary philosopher. Right? He says his philosophy amounts to a Copernican revolution. Copernicus was the first in the modern world to suggest that the sun was at the center of the system and not the earth. Right? So we now have a solar system right, instead of a geocentric system. And if you think of the cosmos as the Earth at the center, we're at the center of God's plan for the world, and everything revolves around us, well, that's got some pregnant metaphysical implications and value implications. If you think, by contrast, that we are just kind of a putsy planet 93 million miles away from the center of the action, the sun is at the center, and we're just whizzing around in largely empty space, that also has some kind of cosmological, metaphysical implications. So that shift from geocentric to solar-centric, right? absolutely important. And what Kant is saying is that that's exactly what he's doing philosophically. Philosophy, up to his point, had assumed, as he said, that we are concerned with objective reality, that there's a reality out there, and that our job as philosophers is to get it right, that reality is what it is. It sets the terms, and it's our job to have our minds map, right, or somehow represent, or somehow theorize the way things really objectively are out in the world. Kant's argument is that that is impossible. That we realize here, speaking collectively for philosophers, right, at that point, have been trying for millennia to do that. And Kant is convinced by the skeptical arguments to say that that is impossible. 
There is no way for us to be objective about what is out there. And so what we need to do is a Copernican shift and recast everything on subjective terms. So it's a deep transition from a commitment to objectivity to subjectivity. When you do that, you're in a different philosophical territory. And what's going to then happen over the course of the next centuries is the implications of that get played out increasingly over the generations. Now, one uh, thing I would mention here, uh, I, I don't know if you've read all the way through the Critique of Pure Reason. It's a big book. Kant is not a, noted for his stylism. But there is a very important section at the end, or toward the end, of the Critique of Pure Reason called The Antinomies of Reason that Kant uses as kind of a capstone set of arguments about why he thinks we have to abandon the idea that we can know reality, that we can be objective in any fundamental way. And they're called the antinomies of reason. And what he does is say, if you take four big issues in the history of philosophy, of course, one of them, is there really a god or not? And Kant says, absolutely, you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a god and that he must exist. But you can also absolutely, beyond the shadow of a doubt, come up with a completely convincing argument that proves that there are no gods. Is the soul immortal? Well, you can prove that the soul is immortal, but you can also prove that the soul isn't. Do we have free will, or is everything determined? You can prove both of them. Right? Did the universe have a beginning in space and time? Well, yes and no. Okay. And as far as logic and reason right, and the validity of arguments go, Kant is convinced that arguments on both of these sides are completely legitimate. And the conclusion that he draws from that then is to say, if this tool of reason can reach contradictory conclusions on the same issue, that shows that reason is out of its depth when it's trying to grapple with these deep metaphysical issues. So we just have to stop being metaphysical about those issues. All right, now that's my five minute summary for why Kant is important, okay? And I take a lot of heat on this, right? Justifiably so, because there are good arguments to be made that Kant is pro-reason, right, in various some respects, but this is an important turning point according to my argument. Now what I want to do is just point out some dates here. Kant died in 1804, <clears throat> all right. So what's that, 214 years ago now, all right? So I want to jump just kind of a long generation, just to give you a whiff of what has happened in the history of philosophy after Kant, because Kant, uh, everybody has to know Kant and react to Kant since Kant's philosophy. Let's jump to 1843, Kierkegaard, right? If you're interested in existentialism and certain forms of Protestant theology, Kierkegaard, you have to grapple with him, another giant, right, in the pantheon. 40 years later, but what we have is an explicit irrationalism by the time we get to Kierkegaard's chapter. If you want to believe the things that are genuinely meaningful in your life and are going to give you significance, you have to make a leap, as he puts it here, into the absurd. Right? Because the things that really give us meaning in life, right? we can't make sense of them rationally, but we really want to believe them and feel that we need to, so we need to do a leap of faith. Unfortunately, we've got all of these pro-reason philosophers who say we have to be rational, right, and so forth. And so what we need to do then is crucify reason, right? Go on the attack against reason. So we're very deeply anti-enlightenment, right, uh, in this school 40 years later. All right, that's 1840s. Another 40 years, it's not perfect math. What's that, 43 years, all right, Nietzsche. Astoundingly important philosopher for the last 100 years writing, how pitiful, how shadowy and fleeting, how aimless and capricious the human intellect is. Right. So anti-rationalism right, with a vengeance right, 80 years later. Jumping another 40 years, Martin Heidegger, whether you love him or hate him, right, the man was a screaming Nazi after all, right, so I'm going to be a little bit prejudiced. but. Brilliant, brilliant philosopher, right? Uh, even though I disagree, again, fundamentally with him. He's on my top three list of most important philosophers of the 20th century. Most philosophers, right, will agree with this. And again, he's talking about here we're trying to do some metaphysics and reason our way to certain conclusions, and we just keep reaching these contradictions. And here's this contradiction that has nagged philosophers for a huge amount of time. And Heidegger's reaction to that then is to say, if this contradiction breaks the sovereignty of reason, then the fate of the rule of logic is also decided. Logic disintegrates in the vortex of a more original 
questioning. So some issues that we want to grapple with right somehow, logic gets in the way, reason can't wrap its mind around it, so we need to set aside logic, set aside reason, and find some other way to get to that. And the point just is that there's now a long irrationalist tradition of philosophy, very powerful and very prominent, right after Kant, and by now we are getting into the 20th century. All right. Um, those are all what we call continental philosophers. These guys are also continental, uh, but they are of a different school that is typically seen as a pro-reason, pro-science school, and things have been going on in post-enlightenment philosophy also in the 1800s and as we got into the 20th century. But many of the pro-science philosophers are also reaching skeptical, dead-end kinds of conclusions. So I'll just give you some names here. Moritz Schlick, leading logical positivist thinker reaching conclusions about language. Right? Language is not a tool that we use objectively to try to come to understand the world. The rules of language are, in principle, arbitrary. Right? So language is an arbitrary, subjective uh, vehicle that we use. Logic, the scientists are all about logic, right? And logical proof, right? And, and, and building uh, uh, mathematics on, on logical foundations, right? And so forth. Logic, uh, according to Ludwig Wittgenstein, all the propositions of logic say the same thing, right? that is, Nothing. Logic does not tell us anything. Right? Uh, A.J. Ayer, the principles of logic and mathematics are true universally. OK, fine. That sounds very nice right? if we're interested in science and coming to understand the world. We want universal truth. But why are the principles of logic and mathematics true universally? Well, because we never allow them to be anything else. Right? It's a decisional thing. We just allow them to be true. It's not that they are true and we have discovered them. It's a subjectivism that is being reached at this point here. And the point then is logic, language, mathematics, either empty or subjective. And these are the deep truths that leading philosophers are reaching again now by the first decades of the 20th century. So more, right? Rudolf Carnap, metaphysics and value theory, so metaphysics and ethics, two of the big concerns. What's the nature of reality? What is it to live a good life, the traditional philosophy concerns? Well, metaphysics, including all value and normative theory, logical analysis yields a negative result that the alleged statements in this domain are entirely meaningless. Metaphysics is entirely meaningless. Ethics, entirely meaningless. And if it's meaningless, then it's pointless to try to do those things. We should just set them aside. Brian Medlin, now pretty generally accepted, and I think this is, as a survey truth, true, by professional philosophers that ultimate ethical principles must be arbitrary. That's 1957, published in one of the leading respected journals, right, of philosophy. And I want to cite the 1950s because this is important, right, as a decade. That by the time we get to the 1950s, just the philosophers are the ones that you would read if you take history of philosophy courses, you become a serious philosopher, or you're just a philosophically minded person who wants to know what's going on. All of them are reaching skeptical, empty, nihilistic conclusions about the nature of philosophy. So. Lyotard, Foucault, Derrida, Rorty. The biographical data becomes important. Brilliant guys. They go to school. Born in 1924, 26, 30, 31. Okay. By the time they get into their 20s and early 30s, which is by the time most people get their doctorates, if they're going to get a doctorate, Lyotard gets his in 58, Foucault a little earlier in 51, Derrida in 55. Rorty in 56. They're being educated and reaching professional status in philosophy in the 1950s. What had they learned from all of the genius philosophers that they had read? Okay. Skepticism, emptiness, meaningless, and so forth. And the point is going to be that the reason why these guys are cited justifiably as the leading postmodernists is that they are the ones who best recognized where philosophy was in the 1950s and the 1960s and decided what to do about it, what the next steps were going to be. They were the ones who 
reacted to the failure of philosophy in the middle part of the 20th century and came up with the alternative. And what's the alternative? So this is my first thesis. I'm going to say we've talked a lot about knowledge, right truth, meaningless right, and so forth. This claim here is that Kantian epistemology is the ground root, but as things get worked out over the course of the next century and a half, by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century, postmodern philosophical foundations have been laid. And I've just got this interesting quote from Nietzsche, right, who's uh, kind of on the same page here. If you take Kant seriously and apply it consistently, you will end up with a gnawing, crumbling skepticism. Okay. Now, he was projecting, and that's exactly where philosophy got 50 years after his death. Okay. And that's the thesis that I am arguing. So when you are encountering postmodernists, and on one side of their mouth, they're saying, you know, nobody knows anything right for sure. Right? It's all just semantics. Right? There are different interpretive frameworks. You have your narrative. I have my narrative. They have their narrative and so forth. And it's all just narratives. Well, narratives are just subjective constructions that push various value buttons right, that we have. And we have no objective way to adjudicate the value or increasing betterness of one compared to the other. That's this. Right? And there's a deep philosophical story for why that came to ascendancy in the Western intellectual world when it did. All right. I think that's a good argument, partly because I made it up myself. <laughs> and I know uh, there's a lot of good counter arguments right, that can be made about that. And we were just flying over the territory at 40,000 feet, so to speak. But there's a thesis there. But I do think this argument I've made so far has a problem. Any guesses? It's false. It's, it's, false. <laughs> it's not complete. Okay. The problem is going to be politics. Right? And I haven't said much about politics. Right? But we also know when we talk with postmodernism that there is a politics at work there as well. Right? So that has to be integrated into the story right, as well. So the angry young man. Right? This is not just, you know, I'm, your, your theory of concept formation and linguistic semantics needs some adjustment hicks. Right? Right? It's something more significant right, going on. And we know that politics gets people juiced up. So we have to talk about politics right, a little bit here. Now suppose, though, that we believed, sorry, this thesis was true. Right? That really what postmodernism is about is some really deep people thinking about knowledge and truth and epistemology and metaphysics and reaching some really skeptical conclusions. Yeah, I, I guess nobody really does know anything. Maybe it is all just subjective. Right? Maybe we all just do make up things that push our own value buttons and, and so forth. Or we're just culturally determined by the groups. Or, well, maybe that's true. So maybe I'll just be a skeptic okay? about everything. Right? And that then means that I and everybody else, when we believe things, we're really just making arbitrary, subjective commitments to this, that, or the other thing, whatever we want, right? Because that's what subjectivism is all about, bottom line, right? Suppose that's true. What would that mean for politics? All right, so there's, what, maybe 150, a couple hundred people here, right? So suppose we all did a lot of philosophy, and all of us right, came to be screaming subjectivists, right? All right, that's a bit flip really strongly believing that there is no truth, that everything is just subjective, right, whatever, and so forth. I said, all of us then are making our decisions about what we're going to believe and the value parts of our lives. We're going to include that some political views, right? So we're all going to make arbitrary, subjective commitments to a certain way of thinking about the world politically. And so we all do that. And then we do the survey. So we just go around the room and say, OK, what, what, what politics did you subjectively commit to? Right? And he says, well, I don't know. He's a big strapping guy. He says, I want to be the king. Right? I'm, I'm into monarchy. And I think looking around, I have a pretty good chance that I could pull it off. Okay? <laughs> Form a few strategic alliances right, and so forth. Okay? So, yeah. I don't know. You seem like a very sweet right, person. You say, I don't know. I think everybody should be nice and 
get along and share everything right, with everybody. So she doesn't like monarchy, but she's going to write to commit. Right? And you, somebody says, no, no, I think people should uh, have freedom and uh, rights are absolute. Right? And other people are going to be fascists. And right? I, th I think I like the idea of, I don't know, let's all go back to the land and live in tribes right, peacefully in harmony with nature. So some kind of tribalism right, and so on. Okay. So we're all just doing our subjective fantasizing. How many different politics will we come up with right, in this room? Right? I don't know. Right? If there's 160 people, then maybe 165, right? because five people right, are indecisive and change their mind right? and so forth. And you're, that's fine, because everything is subjective anyway. Right? OK, good. So what we would expect then, and this is the more serious hypothesis, is if Everything was just about people reaching skeptical, relativistic conclusions about knowledge and truth, that when they turn to value issues and political issues, they would be all over the map politically. You would have people making subjective leaps into all kinds of normative programs and political programs. But, and this is the problem, when you look at the postmodernists, they are not all over the map politically. If you, however you define the political spectrum, far whatever right over here to far whatever right over here, right? if everything was subjective and random, then we would expect a random distribution on the spectrum. But what we find is that all of the postmodernists in the first two generations, without exception, now don't take it on faith for me, but I can give you the list and you can do your own homework. You take the top 10 leading postmodernists and they are all here on the political spectrum. You take the top 20, the top 50, the top 100, the top 200 most cited people in the literature. They are all at the very far left end of the political spectrum. And that's not an accident. Right? That's not a random distribution. So that's the problem. Why is it, then, that we find a very powerful contingent of thinkers who subscribe to far left politics now adopting postmodern, skeptical, relativistic, subjectivistic epistemology. What's going on there? All right. Go back to biography. There's the big four. I'm using them as representative. Lyotard, if you add his politics, by the time he's in the 50s, right, he's a young man. And like most young people, we get into politics and we get passionate right, about our politics. He committed to far left version of neo-Marxist politics. Foucault joined the French Communist Party, uh, was with them for a few years, broke with them. But then in the 60s, became a kind of Maoist, right? another kind of communism. Jacques Derrida. Politics did not join the French Communist Party, almost, right? but he did hang around in those circles, publish in those journals, and as we saw in the quotation earlier, said his entire agenda was in a certain spirit of Marxism. Richard Wardy is an American. These three are French. Right? Communist Party, never that strong right, in the United States right, for various reasons, but on the American political landscape, Rorty is a strong social democrat and about as far left as you can go uh, on the American political landscape. And the same thing holds for Stanley Fish and the others as you go through the list, all on the very far left part of the spectrum. So what we then have is a number of individuals, very smart, committed to far left politics, but in the 1950s in a very skeptical philosophical world. Now, the politics matters in another way because, all right, here's Uncle Carl. I swear to you this, my introductory microeconomics professor looked exactly like that guy. <laughs> and it was really disconcerting because I was reading a lot of Marx right at the time. This guy was actually kind of conservative, right? and so it was a little cognitive dissonance here. So what does far left, especially Marxist philosophy, mean? Of course, lots of things that we said. So I'm just going to give you a thumbnail thing here. But here's a few things. Four claims of classical socialism Marxist version. Right? 
Two of them are going to be moral claims. If you compare capitalism to socialism, which one is morally superior and which one is morally inferior? Right, so there's the moral agenda. And Marx, as we know, right, thought economics was the mother science, the foundation right, of everything that is built upon it, foundational economic claims about the economic productivity of capitalism compared to socialism. And this is worked out by Marx and his colleague Engels primarily and others in the middle part of the 1800s. Right? Communist Manifesto is published in 1848. Right? So hold that date in your mind. So, First, the moral claims. Capitalism is exploitative. You have rich people, you have poor people. The rich people have the power. They use their power to keep the poor people down and to extract right, wealth from them. It's competitive, it's uh, imperialistic, and so the capitalist profit motive brings out the worst in people, and it's a dog-eat-dog -dog struggle, right, and so forth. Socialism, then, is moral because it rejects the impetus of capitalism, the competition, the class society basis instead. It's committed to humanity, it's committed to peace, everybody is going to share, and we're going to try to keep people equal. All right, so, moral claim. Capitalism uh, seems to be doing all right and is more productive than feudalism was, right? But ultimately, it's going to be less productive than socialism, the Marxists, right, are claiming, right? Because it's got these internal contradictions that are going to work its, their way out, and as a result of that, it's not going to be able to keep its act together. The poor get poorer, the rich get richer. This causes internal conflict right, within the advanced capitalist societies and the whole thing then will collapse in revolution. Socialists by economies, by contrast, they will be more prosperous because people are going to be working with each other instead of against each other. And at least in the early stages, we're going to have a dictatorship of the proletariat, but the dictatorship will be wise, benevolent leaders who are able to assess the economy as a whole and make proper allocations of resources and distribute things right appropriately. And so we will be much more right, productive. So a pair of moral claims and a pair of economic claims. Classical Marxist socialism. Now the other thing I want to add to this is that Marxism labels itself as scientific socialism. Right? So it's socialism, but we're not just abstract dreamers. We are socialists who think we have studied the way the world works. The iron laws of economics right, are going to work out. Human nature, we have the right theory of it. This theory yields definite predictions about the way the world is going to go, and we are going to stand on those predictions. We are scientific about this. This is not utopia. It's reality. So. Another death by PowerPoint chart. Let me talk you through it. Marxism is a class analysis. Right? So let's take the slogan, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We all know that one. But we'll tease it out. What does that mean when we actually apply it to a social scientific understanding of the way capitalist society works? Well, we say we have three classes. We have the working class, the proletariat. We have a middle class, because there had been a rising middle class, and we have the upper class. The working class, they're weak, they're poor, right? they don't have much status. The middle class, they're comfortable, but they're unstable. And the upper class are the powerful and the rich people. Okay? So that's where they are initially. Initially, what's going on then in capitalist societies is, of course, the poor are being exploited. Right? The wealth is being extracted from them. There are so many of them. Wages are pushed down. Capitalists get to make all of the rules. They control the government so they can extract as much wealth as they want. And so these guys are exploited, and it's very hard for them to get out of their condition, if not right, impossible. And so they're basically going to, uh, uh, as Marxism predicts, become more and more people in the population. Right? So the prediction then is going to be, as capitalism advances, more and more people will be forced into poverty right, as a result of the capitalist dynamic. The middle class, right, they're unstable because the logical capitalist competition right, says there's winners and there's losers, and we're all competing with each other. Some people in the middle class will succeed in clawing their way up to the rich class, but the most of them are going to at some point make a mistake, right, or they're going to be outcompeted, and they'll be forced down into the proletariat. So the claim of classical Marxism is that the middle class really has no future. It's going to be squeezed out. Right? And that then predicts population should asymptotically approach zero right, uh, for the future. And the rich right, start off. They're exploiting and ruthless. They've got all the power. But of course, they're all competing with each other. Right? Because if you're a millionaire, you want to be a 100 millionaire. Then you want to be a billionaire. 
And if you're a Marxist, you believe that's zero-sum competition. And so the logic then is to say fewer and fewer rich people will succeed at this ruthless competition, and they will slowly amass all of the wealth in their own hands, and then all of the other former semi-rich people will be forced down right, the chain of class. So we have very then three social science predictions that we make. Right? Population of the poverty, people in poverty will go up dramatically under capitalism. The middle class will shrink to nothingness, and the rich class, the bourgeoisie, will also shrink to a very small number. Now, the problem then is going to be, and I'm going to say this is a problem, that even in Marx's lifetime, and certainly in the succeeding generations right, of Marxists, by the time we get to 1900, Right, 1920, right, and so forth, and we march our way through, is that all three of those predictions failed. And it's not just that they failed by a little bit, right, or that the data was mixed, but that the, all of the data is showing that the exact opposite right, is coming to pass. If you look at poverty rates under the more capitalistic nations, rather than more people living in poverty, po poverty rates are going down. They're going down significantly. That's an opposite. The middle class is supposed to be becoming smaller and smaller. Instead, what is happening is it's getting bigger and significantly bigger. The number of people who are rich is supposed to be getting smaller and smaller, but the problem is the number of rich people is getting more and more. Right? Damn it, there's just more and more millionaires, right? And then billionaires, right, and so forth. Now, this is a problem because if you think of Marxism as social science, Social science stands on its predictions as measured against the data. And by every measure, right, Marxist social science failed to fit the data. In fact, the data was the exact opposite. And this caused a crisis, not only you know, by people who were not sympathetic to Marxism, say, ha, 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 you Marxists got it all wrong, but a crisis within Marxism. And what you find when you read the Marxists of each succeeding generation is they are aware of the data. We predicted this, but now the data says that. What do we do? And of course, we need to start tweaking the theory right in various ways, but this is a problem. And as the generations go on and the predictions get worse and worse, right, the problem gets more and more. Now, I want to say that the crisis reached ahead again by the time we get to the 1950s. And the reason for that is important, partly because if you look at the first half of the 20th century, right, the Marxists had said World War I Right, the Marxist theory of World War I is it's all the capitalist countries getting together and going to war over resources. And what's going to happen is the capitalist countries will basically kill each other off or weaken each other, and that will provide a space for the communist revolution of some sort right, to fill the vacuum. That didn't happen. But good news, depression, right? The Great Depression happened. Marxist theory says. Right? This is the final death throes of capitalism, stock market excesses, capitalists getting greedy, et cetera, et cetera. Capitalism is over and out of the economic collapse. Right? The proletariat will get their acts together and we will have revolution. That didn't happen. World War II, well, this is one that's a little bit more complicated because we've got the communist nations fighting the fascist nations, fighting the liberal democratic nations. But the theory was going to be that the fascists and the liberal capitalists would weaken each other and then communists, if they bided their time and thought strategically, by the time right, one killed the other, the remaining one would be weakened and we would be able to kill them, and then communist revolution of some sort right, once again. By the time you get to the 1950s, though, it's clear that's not going to happen. Because what's happening in the 1950s? Well, fascism is gone. But it's probably coming back, unfortunately. Right? But, but it's gone. Right? And we do then have the familiar Cold War contours right, of the Soviet Union versus the left uh, or the liberal democratic nations right in the West. But the liberal capitalist nations have recovered from World War I, from the Depression, from World War II. And things are pretty good right, if you start looking at what's going on. The poor in the 1950s in the capitalist countries, right, they're all buying cars and television sets. Right, and the interstate has been built, so they're taking all these trips. right. And international flight is increasingly available to everybody. Everybody's enjoying all of these movies, right? And eating better, and people are getting taller, et cetera, et cetera. So by the time we get to the 1950s, if you are on the very far left and sympathetic to Marxism, it's not looking good, right, in terms of the data. 
So it gets worse. We've had 100 years of waiting for the revolution. It hasn't happened. Capitalists are doing better and better, it seems. But what about those moral claims? Capitalism is inhumane. Well, of course, you know, there's lots of things we can complain about how Canadians have treated each other and how Americans have treated each other and human rights issues, right, and so forth. In the grand scheme of things, those are important, but relatively light by historical standards. By and large, you've got a pretty good chance of putting together a pretty good life if you're living in one of those countries. But on the other side, Two crushing blows happened in 1956. Right? And these were crushing blows to Western Marxists especially. Because for a generation, Western Marxists had thought, despite the predictions about the economic modeling right and so forth, at least we have the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is a beacon of our humane moral future. It's a communist revolution that succeeded. And Stalin, Papa Joe, is at the helm with the power to do what is necessary to usher the Soviet Union and therefore eventually the rest of the world in the right direction. An almost messianic right, fervor about what was going on in the Soviet Union. Any number of fellow travelers go over there, they take the tours, they come back, write glowing right, reports. 1956, Stalin has died, Khrushchev has consolidated power, and he announces in a speech that all of those stories about genocide, about the asylums, about the torture, about Siberia, were true. It wasn't just CIA propaganda, it was all right. Tens of millions of people tortured, starved, exterminated, right? under what was supposed to be the humane social system that ever existed. How is this possible? 1956 also in Hungary, one of the satellite states, right now behind the Iron Curtain. Things aren't going very well economically. Right? Students in university classes are chafing at having to take only Communist Party propaganda right in their courses, right? They want a more liberal curriculum. They want to have jobs when they get out. Workers are hungry, right? And so there are protests that are starting, peaceful protests. Well, we know socialist governments care about their people. They care about the workers. They care about the students. The reaction of the Hungarian government was to call up Moscow, say we got big problems here. Moscow sent in the troops, sent in the tanks, and Protesters are shot. The ringleaders are dragged off to prison. They are tortured, forced to give up their allies, who are then arrested and tortured. And tanks are sent into the protesters and ride over people. And Western technology, for the first time, this is shown on international television. Everybody sees it. It's not just CIA propaganda again. How is this possible? This is a crisis of faith in the 1950s. So the old left, that is to say the Marxist left, is in trouble. What are we going to do? And what do you do if you are a young person in your late 20s and early 30s, strongly committed to your politics, and you're really, really smart? Well, you re-strategize. And so one of the things that we do know that happened is this is exactly when the new left started. So we have a new left, a new agenda, right, and so forth. And the point is going to be that that agenda right, is being set by the strategists, and the strategists are the most philosophically minded of them, and we know who those people are going to be. So this is the second thesis. That is to say that by the time you get to the 1950s, what has happened is, yes, philosophy is at a very skeptical place epistemologically. But at the same time, people on the far left are going through a crisis about what we are supposed to do now that our youthful dreams in the classical Marxist ideal have failed. And even all kinds of neo-Marxism have been tried, those have failed. 
And the practical results in the Soviet Union and other places as tried have failed. We need to do some serious thinking. Now, I've used the word faith. And I want to uh, say that there is exactly a parallel here. Because if we think <clears throat> about the kinds of uses of faith that we're more familiar with, what happens if you're an intelligent young person and you believe a certain religious worldview? Typically, you come to believe that it's true. It explains a lot of things. But it also has a strong normative component. You believe that it is moral and decent, and that it's the hope for humanity that your religious vision come to prevail more. But then you start to grow up, and you start to realize that there are lots of smart people who believe very different things right about religion. You start to have arguments with them. And sometimes they've got really good arguments. And you find yourself questioning on the basis of the evidence and the data, whether your religious views right or true. Yeah. And sometimes you reach the conclusion that, you know, I don't actually think the arguments for my religion are, are that good. A lot of holes have been poked in them. They can't be true. And these various alternative religions, including non-religions, the arguments for them are pretty compelling. So we have a crisis right, of faith that, of course, we know millions of people go through. And to put it in polarized terms, it's, am I going to go with what seems to be the best arguments, the best logic, the best evidence, to go with my reason? Or am I going to go with what I really want to be true, which is to say, this religious view that has formed part of my identity and my understanding of what is beautifully and nobly possible for human beings? And what choice do I make? And when it's that polarized, you really have two choices. One choice is to say, you know, the most important thing is the facts, the truth. And I have to go with the logic. I have to go with the evidence. And that means, as hard as it might be for me emotionally, I have to abandon the religion of my youth. And I have to live without that religion, adopt some other more rational religion, or possibly live without religion at all. because objectivity and reasoning matter. And some people do it down that road. But the other option then is to say, you know, I'm going to believe what I want to believe. There's no way I can give up this beautiful, deep part of my identity. And that means that I have to find some way to get rid of the logic, the evidence, and the commitment to reason. That I'm going to elevate a subjective commitment to something I want to be true over reason. And we do know in the history then of religion that there are many religious strategists who take that route. Limit reason, crucify reason, set aside reason in order to rejuvenate personal faith commitment. Now that exact same Psychology carries over to politics. And that's the claim I'm making here about the 1950s socialists. The smart ones recognized that the arguments for socialism had been destroyed. Mises, Hayek, and the others, and all of the empirical data right, that was out there. There's no way to give a rational explication for the economic superiority of socialism right, over capitalism. And the data shows that the socialist nations have been brutal in practice. And that by and large, whatever our gripes are about the West, things are pretty good, morally speaking. But if you're a committed socialist, you're at a crisis at this point, because you believe that capitalism is evil and socialism is moral. But the logic says the opposite. Do you go with what you want to believe, your socialist ideal? Or do you go with the logic? And we do know, again, some people make the different choices. Some people say, OK, I need to modify my socialism, abandon socialism, and move toward some sort of liberal democratic understanding. But a lot of people double down and say, I am going to find a more sophisticated way to bracket reason, bracket the evidence, bracket the idea that on politics, reason, evidence, and logic is fundamental. And that's the postmodern move right there. 
Another colleague at Duke University, Frederick Jamerson, right, Marxist theorist, right, at exactly this juncture says, yes, we are aware of Marxism's and neo-Marxism history. We are aware of how things have gone right in the West. And we do know it is evidence versus political commitment. And he's making his point clear. Everything in the last analysis is politics. Your political commitments are fundamental. Everything will be shaped to fit the political commitments. All right. So the Enlightenment right, versus postmodernism, right, that's the battle we're fighting right now. These guys were young in the 50s, became mature in the 1960s, leading their professions, grand old men in the 70s and 1980s. Right? Uh, trained any number right, of PhD students who then themselves went on to be professors in the humanities right, in the early the 90s, early 2000s, and our generation, and so forth. Extraordinarily successful for the power of their political strategy and their ability to marshal the philosophical and epistemological arguments to support them. Now, that's where we are. So the battle is uh, joined. But I want to uh, now turn in my concluding minutes here and be critical right, of postmodernism. There are literally dozens of important philosophical issues that I'm not going to be able to talk about, obviously. That all of them need to be engaged. There are good arguments for skepticism and good against. Right? And so all of those issues that have led philosophers down varying paths have to be engaged. So I don't want to undermine the importance of any of those. But there are some things that we can say about the postmodern project, the postmodern claims, and about its assessment of the Enlightenment, especially. So, one thing that we are aware of right, is this issue that postmodernists are, as a movement, right, not logically consistent. Right? And there's a certain amount of traction and importance to pointing out the logical contradictions right, that are made in postmodern. So on the one hand, if we say right, that all truth is relative, right, that is an epistemological claim right, that comes out of postmodernism. But at the same time, postmodernists will tell you that in some sense, their way of looking at things is the right way of looking at things. Right? That the other narratives need to be set aside, bracketed. Right? So when we start talking about what gets into the curriculum, for example, the standard postmodern claim is not that there are all these other traditions, right? and they're all relative, and therefore they're all equal, and so we should teach them all. The agenda is, no, the postmodern one is the right way, and we're exerting all of our efforts to get rid of all of these other books that do not fit our postmodern canon. That's a contradiction, and it's worth calling them on it. If we believe strongly relativistically that all cultures are equally deserving of respect because there is no objective stance from which we can evaluate them, there is a big question why it is that Western culture is always singled out as uniquely bad and evil and worthy of condemnation. That's a contradiction. And it's worth calling out right, that one. If we believe values are really subjective, right, then that sits very uneasily right, with the rhetoric that suggests racism really is evil. And I think that's true. Right? But that's a truth claim. Right? Sexism really is evil. Right? But you can't have it both ways. Technology is really bad and destructive, right? but it's really unfair. Some people have so much technology while others are going without. <laughs> we hear both of those right, on a regular basis. One implication of deep subjectivism or relativism is a kind of tolerance. right? If I don't know the truth and you don't know the truth and all we have is our own subjective narratives right, and so forth, well, Live and let live, you do your thing, we should just be tolerant. Right? Dominance is bad, right? The whole exploitation thing. Rich versus weak, that's just that's just wrong. Men subjugating women, right? Value judgments. But what we find, of course, is when postmodernists do assume positions of power in the classroom, in university administration, in other cultural institutions, very authoritarian forms of political correctness are immediately put into place. Not tolerance, not eschewing the use of dominance 
and power. Another contradiction worth calling. Racism, right, sexism, and power, right, right, race class and gender, those are the big three right, in terms of analysis. But when we look at the uh, arguments here, the claim, of course, theoretically, is that liberal capitalist West is deeply racist. Right? But we do know, again, it's a matter of historical record. Slavery was first challenged as morally repugnant in Western nations and in, in nations that adopted the philosophy of the Enlightenment. And it's only been in places where those Enlightenment ideals have made inroads around the world that racist ideas have been put on the defensive. The West is deeply sexist, right? But then if we look at the status of Western women, right, over the course of the last 200 centuries, not that all the problems have been solved here, but it is a very right, progressive story. Western capitalists are cruel to the poor. Well, I'll tell you, if you want to be poor, you want to be poor in Canada, right? <laughs> right. Or the United States, right, and so on, right, for various reasons. All right, now those are just uh, pot shots, right, so to speak. Those are argument starters, right? The clever postmodernists, of course, have thought about these things. Uh, they will have some responses, but these are useful sallies. But I want to now do an unpostmodern thing and actually look at some data, right? Data, facts, logical interpretations, mathematics, statistics, right, et cetera, et cetera. If you're an Enlightenment guy, you think those matter, right? Uh, and I think we should be using them against the postmoderns. The dim ruins of the Enlightenment, the failure of the Enlightenment project. Well, let's look at some data. Are we interested in poverty? All right, this is a beautiful website. Uh, I wish I had this when I was a student, right? But uh, it's a Gapminder. It's a Swedish site. I invite you to go to Gapminder. You can do beautiful things with the data playing around with it. But this is a chart. This is the world in 1812. The, the number is superimposed here. What we have on the vertical axis is life expectancy in years. Right? So it starts at 20, 25, 30, right? And it goes on up to 85 for sneaky reasons that we'll reveal in a few seconds here. Along the bottom here, we have uh, income measures. We have both GDP, gross domestic product, and then we also have purchasing power parity and adjustment for inflation. So we want to keep these numbers across uh, both what you earn and what you can buy with what you earn, and we want to compare different nations with each other. Each of these circles is a nation right, in the world. So there's actually 180-something circles there. They are big circles, big population, small circle, small population, and they're also color-coded for what part of the world you are in. So all of these kind of, I don't know, pumpkin-colored ones, those are European nations. This uh, yellow one here, that's the United States, right, in um, uh, 1812. That one right there, that's Canada right, in 1812. The dark blue nations are sub-Saharan African nations. The big blue, uh, the, and the, rather the light blue, one of them very big, those are the uh, uh, South Asian nations, right, and so forth. Uh, okay, so point then is, I'll give you some numbers here. That's 400, that's 1,000, this is 2,000, 4,000. This is also a logarithmic scale. It's doubling for each right, unit of, uh, of territory here as we go, go along. But what this then is to say is if you go to 1812, right, all of the countries, the country that has the highest life expectancy in the world, it's about 42. And it's uh, GDP about 3,800. That's the richest country in the world in 1812. Guess which one it is? That's England, all right? So this is England, right, uh, about 50 years after the Industrial Revolution started, right? Uh, the First Nation of the Enlightenment, and it's already breaking away right from the pack. If you go to 1712, England is right down around here. Uh, that's the United States. Right. This is France, right. this is uh, Germany, right. and these are Western European nations. And then Canada's lagging a little bit right behind. Okay, um, jump ahead 100 years. We'll go to 1912. Okay, so we have 1812, 1912. Right. One century. Right. That Again, is the United States, but notice how much bigger it has gotten. Right. Population is increasing. Right. Income, right, the United States income was down around here, $2,200 or so. Now it is about 
8,000. Right? Uh, there's Canada, right? keeping company. Uh, these are all Western European nations. These are two East Asian nations that have opened themselves up to trade with the West right, in the previous generation. A lot of other countries are still sticking around. But notice what we have is most of Europe and North America and two East Asian nations have significantly right, improved. Life expectancy, we've now got some nations in the 50s, right, flirting with 60 right at that point. All right, one more 100 years, we'll go to 2012, basically our generation. That's what happened in the last century. Okay. So uh, the United States, right, even bigger, Canada's in there. Uh, Japan, right, Singapore, Hong Kong, all of the Western European nations. These are now the Eastern European nations. Right? This is now after the fall of Soviet Union, one generation. This is where the log scale becomes important because you know, if you take uh, uh, these Eastern European nations here, Right, that's about $18,000 per person. Standard Western European nations, right, it's in the 30s, so it's more than double. Right? Uh, these are the two North American nations. These are the Latin American nations. Right? I believe this one is Mexico. Right? So Mexico is around 15,000, right? uh, despite proximity to Arizona. If you're in Arizona, right, you're about 50,000, so the powder makes a big difference there as well. But look at the sub-Saharan nations, all of them. Right? All of them were down here. Uh, I don't know what parts of the world you travel to. I always tell my students to go to Mexico, and often they do for spring break and so forth. They all come back and say, you know, the poverty in Mexico, I just can't believe how awful it was. It was just horrible. Right? It really is horrible, right, by American standards and by Canadian standards. But Yep, there's the, yep, the Mexicans are right there. Right? By historical standards, that's not bad. Okay? Now, of course, if you're Mexican, right, and you go to some of these sub-Saharan African nations, right, right, it's pretty grim. But this is the striking point I want us to get to. Right? These are all three of the charts here. Every single country in the world, right, 200 years ago was right down there. That is to say, all of the countries in the world were in this lower left quadrant. Right? There's nobody there anymore. Life expectancies have doubled even in the poorest nations of the world. Income has, uh, in some cases, doubled, tripled, quadrupled, right, and so forth, in a space of 200 years. Right? So when someone says what happened in the Enlightenment was a mistake, right, philosophically and institutionally, right, there's some data that speaks to that. Because right? that looks like a success story to me. If you think living long and wealthy is a good thing, and I do. So are you interested in racism and sexism? Of course we are, yes. This is basically the 20th century story about women's education in North America, uh, heavily skewed by American data. So this, each of these lines is a degree. So bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, law degrees, medical degrees, right? Early part of the 20th century and part of the 20th century. The trend lines are all up, right? significantly. Uh, in fact, for bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, it's now 60 to 70 percent of all of them are right, women. Right? It's the men who are having more troubles so, uh, getting those degrees right and so forth. And that looks like right, success to me, and that's in the Enlightenment right, touched nations. Uh, racism, sex, sorry, racism, right, uh, and so forth. This is the story, right, um, Slaves or serfs in the world in 1750, by this measure, about 76% of the world's population was either a serf or a slave, right? At that time, enlightenment is just starting its push to say there's something morally repugnant about slavery. Let's do something about that. And this is the story, right? Until now we get to our generation and we still have slavery and serfdom right in the world, but a very small minority of the population, and we're still going after that. That looks like a success to me. This is a survey published in 2013. You can get this at Washington Post, uh, measuring racial tolerance. Right? One of the questions they ask is, how comfortable are you living with someone in your neighborhood who's of a different race right, or a neighborhood? And so there's dozens of questions that mine that territory. And what we find is in uh, all of the blue, right, those are the nations where 
people are fine with it. The vast majority of people, you find fewer than 5% of the population saying, no, I actually have a problem living with someone whose skin is not my color. Right? Other parts of the world, right, the data is, of course, much more mixed and much more the other way. But again, it's not accidental right, that the nations that are the most blue right, are the ones that are the most touched by Enlightenment philosophy. And that looks like a success to me. So I'm going to assert there's a fact right, that the progress right, has been real, but I'm highlighting the philosophically charged terms because I said fact. Right? <laughs> And I said, progress. And I said, real. Okay? And the philosophical debate right, is, is joint. Okay? Now, of course, all of this has huge implications for the culture wars. Right? If you don't believe in facts, you don't believe in progress, you believe in the opposite of that, you don't believe there is a real biological or physical reality that we are ultimately responsive to. If you think everything is about power and social construction, you will have a very right, different agenda. And that's the one we're dealing with right, right now. Uh, and my argument is, well, you know, if your agenda, whatever your agenda is, the facts and the logic are against you, and I think they are against postmodernism, you should expect some non-factual, factual, non-logical, non-civil, right, non-liberal arts education responses to it. You will find a very negative, hostile, uncivil, warlike response. And that's what we're seeing manifested in what I now think of as third generation postmodernism. And that's what we're dealing with right now. All right, so uh, that's my book. Uh, some of the theses there. I'll stop at this point. And uh, my hosts will let me know how much time I have to field questions. So please have at it. Thank you.